Amen. God is good. All the time. Thank you, Lord. He is such a good God. He is a great God, and he is worthy to be praised. Amen? So how about if we just praise him for one second here? How about if we just stand on our feet for one second? Stand up. Come on. Real quick, stand up. He's your Savior. Come on. Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. You are great and worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord. This morning I get to share with you one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It means so much to me for so many different reasons, but uh, today we're just going to let God uh, express that. Um, But today we'll be in the book of Luke. And if you love stories about Jesus and stories that Jesus tell, you're going to love the next Four months, because it's all about Jesus. It should always be all about Jesus, amen? It is his will, not ours. Thank you, Lord. So we are in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and we're going to pick it up in the 36th verse. 36th verse. Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come to dinner with him. So Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she kneeled behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your word. It never returns void. Lord, we are imperfect vessels, and we speak imperfectly, but God, we know that your word is on point. It is exactly what we need to hear. So, Lord, help me to get out of the way and allow you to speak your truth through your word this day as we adore you, Lord, for you are great and worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you kind of picture the scene, kind of, kind of roll the film here? They're at this house of a Pharisee. This Pharisee's house would have been immaculate. His house would have been so on point that everybody in the neighborhood knew that when they went to this guy's place, that they were in a, going to have a great time as a social gathering. This guy's house, he had a courtyard in the center of his house, more than likely, and that's where most of the activity, life, gets done out in that courtyard, out at that table, maybe a U-shaped table where, listen, the hors d'oeuvres were on point. They're good stuff, man. The, you know, the, the, there'd be live music, right? There would be uh, uh, singing and dancing. There would be lots of wine. There would be lots of laughter. There would be the A-list crowd would be there. So the whole scene, I mean, it's a party. It's a beautiful time. They're getting ready to have a bash, right? But suddenly, out of nowhere, this woman crashes the party. Out of nowhere, this woman shows up where she wasn't invited and wasn't wanted. But she came just as she was. She came, even the Bible says that she was dressed in a way that would be indicative of her profession. The Bible, I think this translation calls her an immoral woman. She needed to get to Jesus. There's some people in the house today, we all in the house today, need to get to Jesus. That should be our heart. You heard it from our pastor. You hear it all the time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This woman entered into a place where she was wanted and was despised, probably because of her profession, obviously, but also probably because there might have been a few people there that knew her pretty well and didn't expect to see her there. But the truth of the matter is, nothing was going to stop her from getting to Jesus. When she got to him, the scene it rolls, she falls to her knees, right? She, is so, she has a heart of gratitude that is so bursting and overflowing 
that she falls to his knees. And in that adoration, in that thanksgiving, in that time, she wept. Have you ever been there? Whenever you get to a, a special encounter or a special time with you and God, you know it's an intimate, personal thing. And it just, it just you may not have any words, but you just break down. You just empty out. This woman, her heart was bursting with gratitude, and she wanted to show it. So she's, she's weeping, she's crying, she, she's washing Jesus' feet with her tears, the text tells us. And then she drops her hair, which is a complete disgrace for a woman at that time, and she dries his hair, or dries his feet with her hair. Can you see the scene? If you were one of those party goers, you were there for a good time, you had this all set up, you're there, you got some expectations, you know, you know this Pharisee, he's, he's the man, he gets, he, a good party. He says, the good wine. You know? Jesus shows up as the guest of honor. She heard he was going to be there. And nothing was going to stop her from getting to him. She entered right through that pretense of, of judgment and walked to Christ and emptied out her heart on his feet with humility, bowed before him. She had been, she had been forgiven, and now she is showing love back to Christ. Love back to Christ. Do you know, he's, so, he's such a good God, right? He did everything that we needed him to do to get us to where he wants us to go. He redeemed this sinner. He redeemed this wretched person. He's redeemed you. He's touched you. He's changed you. He's moving in your life. He is a good God. The Holy Spirit comforts and teaches and all that he wants for us to receive. God wants the greatest gift that Jim could ever give God and the greatest gift that you guys could give God. Here it is to Biggie, a thankful heart. There is nothing greater that you can give Jesus than a heart of gratitude. Nothing. And you know, something happens when, when we get to that place where we give it all to God. And he does what he wants to do in our lives. And it changes everything. It changes everything. A thankful heart, a bursting heart with gratitude is the one gift that we can give back to him. He done, he's done so much for me. Anything that I'm asked to do, I more than likely will say yes. Because he has done so much that I just want to express my love back to him. Even if I make a fool of myself up here or say the wrong thing or act like an idiot or God to help you, if I ever offend you, I apologize in advance. But the truth is, he's a good God, and he wants me. He, he, the Father desires for me to love him back in expression of gratitude. My whole life, an expression of gratitude. Right now, for whatever it's worth, in my view, everybody's looking around saying, what's next? God, what are you doing? What's next? What should we be doing? And they're all great questions, and they need to be asked, no doubt about it. But I think we may have just jumped right over what we should be doing. What we should be doing is giving him thanks. We just got through a 2020. We ought to be giving him thanks that you are here today, that you're able to come to church, that I'm able to come to church, and that I'm able to come here and, and give whatever I could give back to him. A heart of gratitude. A heart of gratitude. Listen, that's so important because, listen, what I find in the Bible, I find like maybe three possible, there may be more, but I found three possible attitudes towards gratitude. Towards gratitude. One is it's unnecessary. Many people believe it is unnecessary to have a heart of gratitude. You say, what? And I'm like, yeah, check it out. Scripture right here. 
chapter 12 in the same book of Luke. It's called the parable of the rich farmer. This guy, and I'll just read it because it's way better this way. When someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell me my brother, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge over your, over your decision of such as that? Then he said, beware, guard every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you owe. Then he says, then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm and produced fine crops himself. Notice the personal pronouns. What should I do? I don't roam. I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all the wheat and all the other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have done, you have stored enough stored away for years. Come now, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. In other words, nowhere in this passage does he give God consideration at all. There is nothing about God in it whatsoever. He has done it all. Men, we have this thing. It's all about if we can do it, we'll do it. We're going to do it. You know, a lot of times that backfires on us, right, guys? <laughs> we need to be people who have a grateful heart. It's not only just the fact that... Um, it's un people feel it's unnecessary, but they also, many people, nobody in here, people I know, uh, many people um, have a hypocritical attitude towards gratefulness or thanksgiving. Like the, the Pharisee and the tax collector, again, in Luke chapter 18. Let me just pop over there real quick. A hypocritical attitude. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God. Notice, he's only using the name God to draw attention to himself in a crowd. That I am not like other people. This is his prayer, right? Imagine if we got up here and prayed like this. I thank you, God, I'm not like them. <laughs> Which would prove I'm just like them. Okay, where was I? Okay, and I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers, I'm certainly not like the tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. Okay. But the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful on me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner... Not the Pharisee returned justified before God. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted, exalted. Hypocritical prayers. Hypocritical attitude towards gratitude. And then finally, the genuine article, the, the, the genuine heart of gratitude we find in the same chapter 18. It's pretty cool, I thought. And this you may have, I'm sure you've heard before. Jesus continued towards Jerusalem. He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria, and he entered a village there. Ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourself to the priests. And they went, and they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, Praising God, and notice this next verse. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet and thanked him. One out of ten had a genuine heart of thanksgiving that they stopped what they were doing and went on purpose to give thanks, to give gratitude, to give the greatest gift we could ever give God, a heart full of gratitude. This morning, I think we can learn a lot from this woman. I know I can. But listen, this lady was at a point in her life where 
she had lost pretty much all hope. There was a time in my life when I had no hope. Maybe the first quarter of my existence on this planet, hope wasn't a word that was spoken in our house. Hope wasn't something that was even talked about whatsoever. To the point where 27 years into that, no hope, living life without hope, it's an awful place to be. If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus and you're living a life without Jesus, you are living a life without hope. Draw nigh to him and he will draw close to you and hope will reign. Hope will reign. Thank you, Lord. Not only three attitudes towards Thanksgiving, but there's probably three levels of gratitude in Thanksgiving too. One, the Bible tells us that we should be people who are uh, thankful. Thankful for the blessings in our lives. In other words, the things that God has done for you in, the, in your life, we are to be thankful for those things. That's the easy one because it's past tense. It's already done. We're just kind of reacting to what God has already done. The second one is to be people who are really ready to uh, be thankful about future victories or future battles. You know, things that haven't happened yet. You know, you're praying and being thankful for what God is going to do or isn't going to do, whatever it may be. Right? And then, and that's even harder because that hasn't happened yet. But then finally, the, the level in which every time I, 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 I thought about this, I keep coming back to Chris and Carla. The third level of thankfulness, of a, a bursting heart full of gratitude, is being thankful when it's very difficult, when you are in the battle, when you are in the fight, when you don't know what's coming tomorrow. That's the hard time. That's hard. When you're suffering with cancer, can you praise them now? Can you thank them now? Can you be healthy in your heart and share the, the gratitude that, that, that's bursting out of you in the difficult times, in the battles, in the I don't know moments? Gratitude. The greatest gift we can give God. Back to our text. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him, a sinner. And then Jesus answered his thoughts. Very cool. He answered his thoughts. Simon, I say to you, to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. When Jesus says, listen, I got something to say to you, you better listen. You better listen. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told a story. Great. Jesus' stories are so cool, man. You're going to love these months coming. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Jesus is asking the Pharisee. He answers, I suppose the one who canceled the larger debt. I don't know about you, but my debt's pretty big. My debt's so big that there's nothing I have, have, can do anything about. Your debt is unpayable by you. It can only be paid by him, only through that sacrifice. Right? Simon answered, yeah, the guy that forgave more. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me to wash. You didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came in here, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. Simon was mortified. The Pharisee, the dude, was off. He was, 
He could not believe what's going on at his place. He prided himself more than likely as being the man in town that throws the parties, you know. And when there was a social mishap or when somebody showed up that, you know, maybe shouldn't have been there, you know this dude was losing his mind. He didn't say it, but he was thinking it, right? And Jesus, the text says, he responded to his thoughts, right? It doesn't say what Jesus was thinking about. But I'm pretty sure that I know my God enough that he's probably thinking, I don't like that dude's attitude. I don't like that dude's attitude. So let me tell you a story. Guys went, one guy owed uh, two weeks worth of, of wages. Another guy owed two months worth or four months, whatever it is, worth. They were both forgiven, right? They were both forgiven. Then he compares the two. Right? The Pharisee, the Pharisee's greeting was very proper and even professional-like. The woman was passionate. The, the Pharisee treated Jesus civilly, but the woman, she, she celebrated him. The Pharisee, he analyzed Jesus while she was adoring him. Right? The Pharisee's love was measured. Her love was extravagant. There's a big difference. What's the difference? What did she know that, that the Pharisee didn't know? What do you know that the world doesn't know? The simple truth. She knew that she needed to understand even better the immense need for God's grace and his great love for her. That's what he knew. That's what she knew. Simon didn't know that whatsoever. Right? Simon judged her because it made him feel better. Right? Judging someone else because you think you're a better person than that person makes you feel good. Jesus is like, ah, no. Doesn't work that way. Whatsoever, it doesn't work that way. Right? Jesus is constantly teaching us that the standard is not if I'm better than you or you're better than me. We can all find somebody that's way better off than we are, and we can always find somebody way worse off than we are. So how do we judge our standard? It, it, that's not the standard. The standard is perfect perfection. The standard is Sin is critically difficult, and sin always destroys. Always destroys. The text tells us, well, let's just read it. 47, I tell you, her sins, they are many. They are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table amongst themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sinners, sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. What's he teaching? He's teaching us. He's teaching his church and all who will listen, right? The offense is always sin. And there is no making light of sin ever. Sin brings death. The sacrifice that Christ made is all sufficient. All sufficient. What he's saying is when we, as his people, with a grateful heart, are willing to, right, willing to see my immense need for Jesus. When I am willing to see my immense, me, my immense need for God's grace. When I see my failures covered by the grace of God time and time again. I will love more. You will love more, the text says. We, as a church, as the body of Jesus Christ will reflect the heart of God 
more clearly or as much clear as possible when we love from a heart of gratitude. And just a side note, there's people in here today, I assure you, that have an unforgiveness problem. You have an unforgiveness problem. It may not be an offense against you. It's more likely it's you not forgiving you. We tend to gravitate to God's grace and his forgiveness and gratitude overflows because of it. But yet we still don't forgive us. Listen, if that's anybody in the room today, or online listening, no matter what's going on, no matter what's going on, God's grace is sufficient. He has forgiven you. He has forgiven me. I have no right whatsoever to trump God, place myself above his judgment, and continue to judge myself on past sins that have been forgiven. So if you're in here today, or you're out there today, and you haven't forgiven yourself after God has forgiven yourself, just hear this. Don't exalt yourself above Christ. You have been forgiven. You have been forgiven. Hallelujah. God is great. I have been forgiven. I should have never, in my view, been forgiven. I would have never have forgiven me. But because God says it, and he is my authority, he is my way, then I have to show myself as some grace. I have to forgive myself for past failures when God has already done it. Don't allow that. That will steal our joy right from our walk with God. Okay, good. Away from the nugget. <laughs> Jesus was ridiculed. He was despised. He was scorned. He was rejected. He was blasphemed. He was beaten. And he was finally crucified. And the whole time, because of his great love for you and me and the world, he always gave thanks in all things. We, too, should be people who are willing to allow um, an overflow of gratitude, that it fills us up so much, right? It just fills us that it has to go somewhere. It has to come out. And it comes out in the expression of love. It comes out in the expression of, of serving each other, loving each other, serving those around us in our community. I read an illustration this week, and I just want to read it to you before I close. Kind of, kind of, uh, shh, I don't know, illuminates a thankful heart. In a city, <clears throat> a city missionary in London was called to an old tenement building where a woman lay dying in last stages of, ter of this terrible disease. The room was cold, and she had nowhere to lay but on the floor. When the missionary asked if there was anything he could do, she replied, I have all I really need. I have Jesus Christ. Deeply moved, the missionary went home and penned these words. In the heart of London City, amid the dwellings of the poor, these bright and golden words were uttered. I have Christ. What want I more? Spoken by a lonely dying woman on a concrete floor, having not one earthly comfort, I have Christ. What more could I want? I also believe, and I'm closing with this, I also believe that there's a, a prophetic aspect, Chris, to this text. I believe there's an aspect of, 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 of future events because what I want for you and what I want for me desperately is to experience what that woman experienced. 
one day, and the day is coming, that we will see him. And when we see him, we will have that same experience that that woman had. An overflow bursting of gratitude. When we see him, I believe we will fall to his feet, bursting with thanksgiving, bursting with gratitude. Weeping. Because that's the best I can do. Because he's worthy. And I'm not. And I'm not. This woman, she illustrates uh, gratitude, boldness, and humility. There are going to be people who are telling you, you're not saved. You're not healed. You're not. You don't know what you are. You don't know nothing. These guys were sitting at that table after Jesus said, you're good, darling. It's okay. You can love on me. I enjoy it. And you know the feeling that she must have had to give back something that we're not even worthy to carry. Those those guys at the table said, no, no, no. He can't be saved. Who is this dude? No. Jesus like ignored those dudes and said, listen, go your way because your faith has saved you. Not everybody Jesus healed was redeemed. Only those who saw him for who he is. He is the God. He is our redeemer. He is our savior. He is our all in all. We move and live and have our being in him. So, It's okay, church. It's okay to be bold when it comes to your faith in Jesus. There's going to be people out there that kind of slow slow your roll. You get to Jesus. Whatever it takes, you get to him. And you show, I'll show the love that he gave me. I can never really even love until I know on some level the measure of his love. So if you're here today, you don't know him. If you don't know Jesus, this isn't some manipulation tactic to try to get you to raise your hand or anything like that. It's so much more. He loves you. And I'm thankful. And nobody can steal that from me or you. Gratitude is powerful. But if you're in here today and you don't know him, don't leave here without him. Don't leave here without him. So if you would, if you just bow your head as like normal. And if there's anybody in here that has the need, that just has to get to Jesus, if that's you, shoot your hand up. I'm not even going to count. Just put your hand up. If, you, if that's you, put your hand up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. A heart of gratitude. We're going to say a prayer this morning, and we're going to ask God to come. Come inhabit the, the souls that desire you this morning, Lord. So if you would, with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you. I can't live without you. I can't live without you. I invite you into my heart. And I push away all things that would draw me away from you. Save me. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, guys. Let's give it up. We got somebody in the house. Give it up. Hey, if you would, if you would, would you stay?